Um, okay, so hi everyone. Uh, today we are having Lior Lon from MIT who will talk about gap distribution of Fourier quasi crystals and Li Yang polynomials. So, Lior, take it away. Thanks. Uh, okay, I see. Yeah, okay, first of all, uh, uh, thanks, Ran and Oi, uh, for both inviting me and for running this. I'm always very happy to see graduate students at the Technion uh, running seminars. <laughs> for some reason, I can't say why. Um, uh, and yeah, um, seems like a small group. So, so please stop me. Whenever you want, uh, I'm sure this is a topic that it's uh, that none of you is familiar with. Uh, but uh, let me show you some motivational pictures. So we're going to get to something that looks like that, which would be fun for everyone. So don't panic. <laughs> but now let me start with uh, with a brief uh, some brief introduction. Uh, so um, yeah, the, the topic that I'm going to talk about uh, is going to relate to three different a priori, very different topics, which are now, which we now know that they are very much related. Uh, so one is Fourier quasi-crystals. The other one is Liang polynomials. And the third one is real rooted exponential polynomials. I'm going to define everything, don't worry. Um, um, I'll start with the with quasi crystals and then Fourier quasi crystals. And quasi crystals is an interesting thing. So the, the issue is trying to find structures which are structures which are not uh, periodic but are close to be close to periodic in some sense. What kind of sense being close to periodic? We're going to discuss that. Uh, I brought here some quote uh, of De Brun from 86, showing, discussing the fact that quasi-crystals is one of these striking mathematical objects that were first, someone thought about it mathematically and just, Years after that, someone actually found such a structure in nature, physically. And in this case, this the someone that found it got the Nobel Prize for that. Uh, so just a bit of uh, name dropping. Um, so the whole uh, trying to define what, did, what does it mean to be quasi-periodic, uh, I guess starts by Harold Bohr, the brother of Niel Bo Niels Bohr, uh, in '49, defining quasi-periodic functions, later on quasi-periodic measures. Uh, then on the mathematics side, uh, we had uh, Yves Meyer that started to play around the 70s uh, with what uh, he called uh, model sets and now are called cut and projects cut and project uh, method uh, that gives something which is non-periodic but sets which are non-periodic but very close to periodic and later on in something that looked completely not, not related and 20 years after that people realized that all of these works were related uh, Penrose constructed his famous uh, Penrose tiling showing that you can tile the plane with, uh, with only two uh, types of uh, tiles and in a non-periodic way, in a way that had some kind of a five-fold symmetry. Uh, on the other side, we had, on the physics and chemistry side, we had uh, Levin, Dov Levin, which is now, uh, which for a long time is a professor at the Technion uh, in physics. Uh, he was a PhD student of Paul Steinhardt. Uh, he was trying to define a new phase of matter, a new type of matter. Uh, at that point, people believe that you have 
uh, matter can be a gas, liquid, or solid. And when it's solid, either you have some kind of uh, periodic structure or you don't have. Uh, and if you have periodic structure, uh, you can shine you can shine radiation on that. And the way that the radiation diffracts, uh, it's essentially the Fourier transform of this periodic structure. Uh, if the diffraction pattern, you see some kind of a lattice structure, then it means that the dual lattice is your atomic structure. And this is how people were classifying metals, classifying all types of, uh, classifying all types of materials uh, in a, a subject called crystallography. And people didn't believe that there can be something which is non-periodic, but still would give you some kind of a diffraction pattern. And Dov Levin, uh, I think, was the first to try to come up with a mathematical model for something like that, which is non-periodic. Uh, and very surprisingly, at the same time, independently, Dan Schechtman discovered uh, a material whose uh, diffraction pattern was uh, something which is cannot come from a lattice. It had a five-fold symmetry. Uh, and then Levin and Steinhardt were, wrote their paper, which was roughly at the same time, and predicted exactly the pattern that he saw. And from that point onward, the world started to believe uh, that there are that there can be in nature uh, materials that have a non-periodic structure, but something which is close enough to a periodic structure to, add a, to have a diffraction pattern. So don't worry if you don't understand any of the things I, I just said, it's just some motivation. And later on in, 2000, in 2009, uh, Dyson Friedman wrote a beautiful article, which if you haven't read yet, I really recommend reading, called Birds and the Frogs, where he categorized the great mathematicians into birds and frogs. He himself, he considered himself as a frog. Uh, and in there, he discussed all kinds of jokes of nature. One of them is that the zeros of the Riemann zeta function behave like a one-dimensional quasi-crystal. Uh, in a sense, which we might talk about later. Uh, and he says that from the point of view of, mathemat of mathematicians, one-dimensional quasi-crystals are much more interesting than two-dimensional or three-dimensional quasi-crystals. Uh, and every everything I'm going to discuss from now on is one-dimensional quasi-crystals. So first, let's, let's discuss the relation between Fourier transform and periodicity. And this relation is coming from the Poisson summation formula. So the Poisson summation formula tells us that if you have a periodic set, in this case, we're in dimension one. So just you, you just have some kind of an arithmetic progression, uh, a set with points which are equally spaced. Uh, and you can define the dual set to be if X, here if X are the points in, in my set gamma, then k are going to be all the points in my set gamma star such that k e to the ikx equal to one for any x in gamma and for any k in gamma, in gamma star. And, and the Poisson summation formula tells us that up to some constant, give me any nice enough function. These are uh, this notation for Schwarz function. These are the test function that we're going to run on. And uh, these are smooth functions that decay faster than any polynomial. And each function like that, if you plug it in and you just sum it over the points in gamma, it's like summing over the Fourier transform of this function at the points of gamma star. This is what we call the Poisson summation formula. And essentially it means that in some sense, if we're uh, in some sense, it means 
that if we would if we would run over all the points with e to the i k x where i let k be my some kind of a parameter then this infinite sum and again it's it's not really well defined it's it's heuristic this thing is going to be the dirac delta uh, at the point the dirac dirac delta at points uh, um, blah, 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 blah. let me do it like that this would be this sum of dirac deltas at points k prime evaluated at this point k so what it means it means that if i'll try to plot it if i'll try to just sum say the first million points in gamma with these exponents i would get huge peaks that looks like that and these peaks are exactly going to be at the locations in this gamma star. Now, this weird phenomena, uh, you have some huge cancellation that's happening. And it was believed that it only happened when it only happens when we are at periodic setting. But now we ask, can, can this happen if we're not a, not a periodic setting? So can we have non-periodic discrete set, lambda and s, uh, such that when we're summing over s, f, uh, we're summing over a function over the points in x, it's like summing over the Fourier transform over the points in s. So this weird looking cancellation picture. And we can give ourselves some slack and put some coefficients here, some constant coefficients that doesn't depend on the function. Can we have something like that? And if we can, we call this a crystalline measure. So crystal always uh, refer to this, this uh, structure of metals, of periodic, uh, periodic atomic structure with this diffraction pattern. And crystalline measure is kind of like a generalization of that. So something that looks like that has this discrete uh, diffraction pattern. And so the formal definition is crystalline measure is a tempered distribution that its Fourier transform is tempered. Tempered distribution means that it's a linear functional on the space of Schwarz functions. Uh, its Fourier transform is, de is defined in a dual way and everything that I just said is equivalent to saying that you have such a formula, such a summation formula for uh, all Schwarz function. Now we can add a small, another small restriction. You can say, okay, it's possible that, that this sum, this, there are really re huge amount of points in this set, really, really a lot of points dense set, but somehow things cancel out. So we can add another uh, restriction asking that the sum with absolute values on the coefficients uh, against every Schwarz function must be finite. So the equality is without absolute value, but you want that, that the convergence in both sides is, uh, is absolute convergence. Uh, if we have both this and this, we call it a Fourier quasi-crystal, abbreviate that as FQ. Uh, now some physical motivation. If uh, this set represents atom, then they must have some kind of uh, bound on the gap that they can, on how close they can be to one another. So we would like this set to be uniformly discrete. This means that we have some kind of a bound such that points are always at distance, at least R between them. 
and we want to have unit coefficients. So recall we, we plugged here these, uh, these coefficients just, just to make this thing possible, but can we take all of these coefficients to be one? And this was a long standing question of uh, Yves Meyer. Uh, is there a non periodic FQ uh, for a quasi crystal uh, such that all coefficients are, are one and the support is uniformly discrete? And the fact is, we're asking only on the coefficients on one side, is that we cannot control both sides. So up to now, the definition is very symmetric. Lambda and S look pretty much the same, but now we need to choose a side uh, because if we, this, this, if we just ask that both Lambda and S are uniformly discrete, then this already dictates that we can only have periodic things and we really want to get something which is non-periodic. Uh, and in 2020, uh, Kurasov and Sarnak uh, found that the answer is yes, and they actually gave, they actually constructed uh, such a non-periodic Fourier quasi-crystal. And the construction would look like that. So let me explain what is it that we are going to see. So the Kurasov Sarnak construction in general says the following. We start with some special polynomials. We call these polynomials Liang polynomials. Uh, I will define this later. And some set of positive numbers, some vector of positive numbers. And we define this function f of x. We take the polynomial and we plug in e to the i xl1 up to e to the i xln. I, I would abbreviate it from now on as p and exponent of i xl. So exponent of i xl, it's this vector. And I will let, now I can let lambda uh, be the zeros, the points in the complex plane where f is equal to zero and ax would be the multiplicities or the degree of a zero. These are analytic functions. It has a well-defined degree of a zero. And, and the fact is that because we started with a Liang polynomial, all of the zeros are going to lie on the reals. And I can take this measure supported on them with the degrees as the coefficients. This measure is going to be a Fourier quasi-crystal. So this construction, okay, this construction where we take some kind of a polynomial, this is the zero set of the polynomial, plotted in the torus. I take some line in, the, in direction L and I'm looking at the zeros and I just look, I just plot the zeros on the, on the line on the reals and I put delta masses on them. This measure is going to be, this measure is going to be a Fourier quasi-crystal and notice that by the way that I constructed it, the coefficients are always going to be positive integers. These are multiplicities. And to answer Meyer's question, they, they came up with this polynomial, uh, which gives, which show, which, for which lambda is uniformly discrete whenever we take L1 and L2 to be, so here we just have two coefficients. So L would have just two entries. We can take them to be rationally independent. Then the set is going to be uniformly discrete. All coefficients are going to be equal to one. And this set would be non-periodic in the sense that it intersect any periodic set at most finitely many points. And their construction looks like that. So the polynomial, if we take this polynomial and we plug the zero set of this polynomial uh, on, the on the torus, on the two torus, it looks like that. And you can see here, you can imagine this thing continuing periodically. And you can see here that you can never get points too close to one another. 
because these lines are somehow have some kind of distance between them. Unlike this picture, where you can see here points which are very, very close to one another that correspond to these two points here. So now we got to Kurosov and Sarnak that started with Liang polynomial and constructed what I would call n-valued Fourier quasi-crystals. So Fourier quasi-crystal where the coefficients are natural numbers. And then came Olevsky and Lonovsky uh, that said, well, you know what? This happens if and only if you started with, uh, you're looking at the zero set of a real rooted exponential polynomial. Now, to be able to explain all of these things, let's, let's start with the definition of a Liang polynomial. So a polynomial in N variables, would call, we would call it a Liang polynomial. If it doesn't vanish on the polydisc and its inverse, th this means that P at the point Z1 up to Zn is non-zero whenever all of the coordinates are of absolute value smaller than one. And it also doesn't vanish if all of the coordinates are of absolute value bigger than one. Now, if some of the coordinates are absolute value bigger and some of absolute value smaller, it can vanish. But we have certain regions where we know it cannot vanish. For example, if we are just in dimension one, we just have one coordinate, then all of the zeros must lie on the circle. We cannot have zeros inside the circle. We cannot have zeros outside. So all of the zeros lies on the circle. For example, take a unitary matrix and take its characteristic polynomial. Now, uh, for larger dimensional examples, we can still take an N by N unitary matrix but now we can just look at the determinant of one minus and put all of your variables inside the diagonal matrix, multiply it by U. You can see that this thing vanish whenever this matrix has an eigenvalue one. This is unitary, so all of its eigenvalues are in the unit circle. And if I plug in a matrix, diagonal matrix, where all of the entries are of absolute value smaller than one, then it con it's con con contracting. So, the so it would take all of the eigenvalues from the unit circle inwards. None of the eigenvalues will be equal to one, so this thing cannot vanish. The same happens if I put here eigen all of these coordinates of absolute value bigger than one. So this is a, an example of, of a Liang polynomial. Why are these Liang polynomials helpful? So suppose that we are starting with some polynomial. Here I'm using the multi-index notation. Uh, maybe let me write what I mean by that. So multi-index notation just means that uh, Z alpha is z to the alpha one times z one times z two to the alpha two ta 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 times z n to the alpha n where alpha is some integers can be zero to the power n. So this is the multi-index notation. So a, a multivariable polynomial ha looks like that, where we're summing over finitely many alphas, multi-indices. Then fx is simply summing over the same alphas with the same coefficients. Only now we have these exponential functions. And wherever, whenever we have a sum of exponential function, I would call it an exponential polynomial. And what does it mean to be real rooted? 
real rooted means that all this is a, a complex valued function and if all of the roots all of the zeros of this complex valued function lies on the reals we call it real rooted and an interesting observation is that if we started with um, if we started with a Liang polynomial, then F must be real rooted. Why? What does it mean if we're looking at this vector? All of these L's are positive. So whenever X has an imaginary part, say positive imaginary part, all of these coordinates are of absolute value smaller than one simultaneously. Can you see that? And if X has a negative uh, imaginary part, then all of these coordinates are of absolute value bigger than one simultaneously. So this means that for F to vanish, because P doesn't vanish when all coordinates are of absolute value larger than one simultaneously or smaller than one simultaneously, then for this thing to vanish, X must be real. So F, so you only get zeros on the reals, which means that if we start with a Liang polynomial, you get a real rooted exponential polynomial. But if we start with a real rooted exponential polynomial, can we construct it from Liang polynomial? And the answer is yes. And that's a recent work uh, that we did, uh, which turns around this whole picture. So again, Kwasov and Sarnak showed that if we start with Liang polynomials, we get these n-valued Fourier quasi-crystals. Olevsky and Ulanovsky show that if we have a real rooted exponential polynomial and we look at the a distribution of its zeros, it's an n-valued Fourier quasi-crystal, and they show that it's an if and only if. And we showed that real rooted exponential polynomial is if and only if, it, it always comes from uh, a construction from the Liang polynomial. So essentially it means that every n-valued Fourier quasi-crystal uh, comes from Liang polynomials in this construction. You can write it as a theorem. And an important part of this theorem is that we can also show that you can always take the L's to be independent over the rationals. So whenever you have an n-valued for a quasi-crystal or the zeros of a real rooted trigonometric polynomial, it would always come from from such a construction where P is a Liang polynomial and L is positive with entries which are linearly independent over the rationals. And this would be important as we're going to look at ergodicity on the torus in a minute. So now some, some of our results. So first, uh, genericity. Recall that this whole business started where Meyer asked to look for non-periodic measures, non-periodic Fourier quasi-crystals with unit coefficients and uniformly discrete support, which he thought there are none or should be very rare. And we are actually showing that a generic, if you start with a generic Liang polynomial, it's a huge family and pretty much any Liang polynomial that you choose, uh, you're going to get non-periodic uh, non set with bounded gaps, uniformly discrete. And the argument is, is based on properties of P that gives us the this bounded gaps, coefficients equal to one and non-periodic. And essentially what you need is that the polynomial has no square factors, that the polynomial has more than two monomials, and that it doesn't have singularities on the torus. Maybe 
So here, at this picture, you remember that we saw that th there are these points where lines meet. These points, I call them singularities. These are singularities of the zero set. And if, the, if we have singularities and we're getting close to a singularity, we're getting points which are very, very close to one another. And if we took this line to be independent, to be independent of the rationals, then we're going to get eventually as close as we want to every singular point, And we're going to get gaps are as small as we want. The, the interesting thing is that the other, so if we have singularities, we, we have as small gaps as we want. On the other way, on the other hand, if we don't have singularities, then we can prove that there are no, uh, that, that the gaps are uniformly bounded from below. Uh, and we can show that this is generically, this is the, a generic situation. We can always perturb a bit our polynom polynomial to resolve all the singularities. So now a bit about periodic versus non-periodic. So we can show that uh, every mu uh, decomposed to a sum of any n-valued Fourier quasi-crystal decomposed to a sum of such Fourier quasi-crystal. This is just the decomposition of the polynomial into irreducible component, into irreducible factors. And each one of these either gives a periodic measure with unit coefficients, or it gives something which is very non-periodic. What do I mean by very non-periodic? I mean, give me, I mean, we have uniform bounds on how many times a, a rational vector space, so the, the Q span of some M points, can intersect my set. So if I, if I take just one point, this means that I have a uniform bound on how many, how many times I can intersect a periodic set. But if I take M, then it gives me also a bound to, to how many times I can intersect the projection of a periodic set. So even if I start with some periodic set in R, some periodic set in Rn, and I project it to some line, this is still something that I'm not going to see, or I'm going to intersect only finitely many points. Now, uh, regarding the gap distributions. So gaps are, again, very important in terms of the, in terms of the atomic structure. And we want to understand their distribution. So the first thing is we're saying these atoms I have some kind of uh, the points in my set grow linearly, roughly, with some error term. And I can really give uh, an, a bound on the error. How many points do I have in an interval? It's going to be something times the length of the interval plus a uniformly bounded error. Uh, Gilad, this is just the Y law. This is just the analog of the Y law. And the gap distributions, uh, so we prove that whenever you have an n-value for a quasi-crystal, there is some kind of a distribution, a probability measure, uh, such that for any continuous function, so suppose I number my points, these are the, that's a discrete set of points, they can come with repetition according to their multiplicity. And let me number them so that it's easy to discuss their gaps. So the gaps are the difference between the point n minus one to the point n. And I can just take any function and just average it over the gaps that I see from one up to capital N. And this average is going to converge to the integration of the function against some kind of a measure. So this is just like saying on the level of averages, it's like I'm, I'm every time I'm asking, I'm, I'm standing at the point Xn and, and I'm asking where, where would the point Xn plus one be? I can just randomly, randomly sample a number, randomly sample a gap from the gap distribution and say, that's my gap to the next point, at least at the level of, at the, at the average level. 
Now, to see what happens here, let's start with the picture that we were looking before and consider this picture modulo 2 pi. So here we have some kind of a periodic zero set, periodic structure. And if we take mod 2 pi, everything just boils down to these two nice lines. But now my linear line starts wrapping around the toes. And as it wraps around the torus, I'm going to see a lot of points. And the nice thing about it is that the gaps, so if I'm looking at the, let me, let's start, let's, let's number the points. One, two, that's not a good number, not a good color. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Now let's look what, what we have here. So I'm going along this and I have one, two. From here, I'm jumping to here, three, four. From here, I'm jumping to here, five, six. From here, I'm jumping to here, seven, eight. From here, I'm jumping to here, nine, 10. From here, I'm jumping to here, 11, 12. And from here, I'm jumping to here, 13, 14. And this would probably be 15. So you can see that the gaps are easily measured in the modulo 2 pi picture. And you can see that they only depend, the gaps, the gap only depend on my location along this red line. In general, it would be a red manifold or red variety. And now comes some nice picture, nice theorem, which I think I won't dwell on it a lot, but essentially, uh, if we take the uh, these uh, numbers, these frequencies, which are linearly independent over the rationals, if we take them closer and closer to the vector 111, we can actually recover the, the gap distribution. We can actually say what the gap distribution is going to be analytically. But uh, let, me, let me not go into this. And let me maybe, okay, let me stop here for uh, questions and then I can, def and then I can continue with some proof for what's happening here. So are there any questions? So I might have a question. Uh, maybe I'll ask this in a, in a language that you and I understand and you can try to translate it for, for the other. So assuming that your polynomial, if I understand you correctly, what you're saying, if your polynomial is fixed, so you, you fix the, the topology of the graph in some sense, then the property of having a Fourier quasi-crystal behavior of the spectrum of the of the of the spectrum is completely determined by whether or not your, uh, the, your algebraic variety has singularities. And if you do have singularities, then you will basically no, no. Al always have not something which is not uniformly discrete. If you so, don't have singularities, then you will almost surely have something which is a Fourier quasi-crystal. So, okay, no, no. A Fourier quasi-crystal can have, not, doesn't have to, to be uniformly discrete. It's defined it's defined as just having the the property. Yeah, I mean, I mean the, uh, the, one, the ones that are the, uh, the, the one discrete. the one that are uniformly discrete. And yeah, so so whenever you have uh, essentially for in in your language any uh, the spectrum of any quantum graph with no uh, with no electric potential but can have magnetic potential with any vertex conditions which are uh, which are scaling invariant, scaling invariant yes. any such a thing would give you a Fourier quasi-crystal. 
uh, but uh, for have a, to have uniformly discrete uh, to have uniformly discrete uh, support, you must have no singularities on the torus, which I think never happens. Yes, uh, 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 it's at, hard for uh, me to imagine a picture where you don't have singularities, right? So I can tell you that the picture of the this is this the picture of uh, the Kurosov Sarna construction is coming just from the from the lollipop graph, but you're only taking uh, the but you're only taking the 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 eigenfunctions that don't that are not supported on the loop. Mm. So so basically, what I really wanted to ask you is. Do you know of examples of strong graphs? And you say no, and you say that, that there should not be. Uh, you will have examples, but they, it won't be all the spectrum, but all this, but the spectrum restricted to a certain symmetry class. Yes, but you won't, you won't have everything. You won't have everything because mm -hmm. these examples are, in a sense, non-generic. They they always have singularities on the torus, mm -hmm. or. It, it, you can think about it like that. If you can find, if you have this quantum graph and you have, and you can find some choice of edge lengths such that you get a multiple eigenvalue, then it means that you have a, a singular and then you're done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can always do that. You can always tweak the edge lengths to find the multiple eigenvalue. Mm -hmm. So, so just for anyone that is not uh, familiar with this language, uh, the motivation for uh, Kurosov and Sarnak to look at this for quasi crystal came from a certain uh, construction uh, coming from the spectrum of quantum graphs. So, if this, if the points that we're looking at here, these points are coming from the spectrum of a quantum graph, it's going to be a quasi crystal. Uh, they wanted to show that, and then when they sat down to show that. Uh, they realize that actually all they are using is not the quantum graph, just the property that to get the spectrum of a quantum graph, you pass through a polynomial equation of this form, and the polynomial happened to be a Liang polynomial. And then they realize that everything that they are doing would work if they just take any Liang polynomial. So now we have a much larger family, and now our the one one of the things that we proved is that any Fourier quasi crystal with integer coefficients must come from such a construction. So now let's do some dynamics because it's what we came here to do. Uh, so, okay, um, I'm sorry. Whenever you see omega, you can it's it's uh, supposed to be L. So this is L, L1, L2. I will, I, I forgot to change it in some places. Uh, so if we start with a stable polynomial, with a Liang polynomial, uh, some, some funny observation, when we're in, in high dimensions, we want this, so we're looking at this zero set. We have this polynomial and we're looking at e to the i x, e to the i y. So that's like restricting the polynomial to the torus and looking for the zeros of the polynomial on the torus. Now, if we have polynomial in n, in n variables, its zero set is complex dimension uh, n minus one, has complex dimension n minus one. So this means that it has real dimension 2n minus 2. And now we intersect it with the torus, which has real dimension n. Usually when we do something like that, we would get something that has dimension n minus 2, meaning it has co-dimension 2 inside the torus. But these polynomials have a certain symmetry that forces the zero set on the torus to be bigger. It's going to be n minus 1. And that's a crucial thing for us. Otherwise, this whole construction fails. The linear flow that we're, the, the, the line that we're walking around would simply miss the, the zero set. 
the line is one dimensional. And if the zero set would be of co-dimension two, it would miss it generically. So we really want the zero set to be n minus one. And that's a crucial thing where we use the fact that the polynomial is Liang. Now, when we have the Liang polynomial and the zero set is going to be of co-dimension one, so it's going to be a hypersurface, possibly with singularities. Usually it looks like that, something like that. And then we're looking at the set of intersection of some line, some Russian, some line, which I will usually take to be independent over the rationals. And we're looking at the intersection points of this line. So that's like the picture that I draw before. We have a set, we have a line, and we, I'm starting to counting the intersection point one after the other. And I'm just plotting them along the reels. And this was my construction. Now I want to analyze this construction. So the first thing that we notice is that if we took these L's to be, the ratio between the L's to be uh, irrational, or in general, in higher dimension, I want the set of L's to be independent over the rational, then this line is going to cover my torus densely, which means that I'm going to get, if I have any singularity, I'm going to get infinitely many times as close as I want to this singularity. Now, whenever I, whenever I get close to the singularities, to the singularity, it means that I get two points which are very close to one another. I get a very small gap and I can take this gap smaller and smaller and smaller as I get closer and closer to the singularity. So this shows why having singularity forces small gaps, forces gaps, forces the infimum of the gaps to be zero. On the other hand, we also show that if you don't have singularities, you have an inf you have a minimal minimal gap and you cannot get smaller than that gap. And what would that gap be? Anyone has a, an idea of what would the gap be? Geometrically, not like not, not a number, like geometrically from this picture. So suppose I'm looking at say blah, 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 this picture where there is a minimal gap. What would that gap be? So basically the distance between your uh, different parts of the... Exactly. The distance in this direction, right? So at every point, at every point, give me any point and go in this direction and you get a, a distant function, right? You get a function that, that I give it a point on my variety and it gives me the, the distance to the next point in this direction. And now I can just take my variety modulo two pi because it's periodic. So I have a compact variety and I actually it's a, it's a manifold now because I don't have singularity. So I have a compact manifold and I have a function which is continuous on that thing. So it has a minimum. And because this function is always positive then it's minimum is positive. Okay. So this, so I will, at some point, I will have a minimum, a minimum uh, distance and none of the gaps is going to be smaller than that minimum distance. But now, so far, I just used the fact that this uh, irrationality gives me a dense uh, line in the torus, but I can do much more than that. I have ergodicity. So let's use ergodicity. So how do I use ergodicity? Let's define this notion. So I have a flow, I have, a, I have my torus, I have a flow, say a flow in direction L1, L2. And this flow gives me a first return map. Iran, you're very, you, I, I, I'm sure you're familiar with Poincaré's work. Poincaré was the first one that defined this first return map when he discussed the three-body problem. Uh, so essentially, we have an ergodic system on the torus, and we want to restrict it to this hypersurface in the torus. So at, how do we do that? You're giving me a point, and I'm telling you, okay, if you flow in direction L, you get to, to another point in the torus. 
So this gives me a map from uh, another point on my variety. This gives me a map from the variety to itself. And there's a certain measure, the measure which would be the cross section up to normalization, it would be the cross section. The certain measure that this map is going to be ergodic with respect to this measure. So it's going to be invariant with respect to this measure. And if I take the L's to be linearly independent over the rational, it's going to be uniquely ergodic. Uh, and I have this function, this little, so capital T, that's the first return map, little t, little tau, that's the first return time. That's the function that we discussed earlier. You're giving me a point and I'm telling you what's the distance in this direction to the next point or how much time I need to spend flying to the next point. And now comes first a lemma that says that this system is uniquely ergodic. So if I'm starting with any point along my variety, I'm starting with any point and I'm starting to jump around with this first term time, and I'm asking how many time I land in a certain set. What's the average time? What's the average time among the first n steps that I'm lying in a certain set? It's going to converge to the measure of this set relative to the measure of everything. Okay, so that's and the fact that I can do start with any point, that's the unique ergodicity. You okay with that? Now comes a certain nice thing that we just discussed that we're saying, suppose that I was in this picture and I got to 0.7 and I want to know what's the distance, what would be the gap between 0.7 and 0.8. So one way to do it is calculate what's 0.7 and what's 0.8. But the other thing, other way is saying, okay, I just care about my location along the variety and then it's going to be my tau L function that I give it the point on my variety and it, is, it tells me the gap, the distance to the next thing, which means that if I want to know, suppose that I want to know how many gaps, so say that I want to know what's the amount of gaps that I have in the interval x to x plus t, and say that I want to have some histogram or ask how many gaps I have smaller than some t, it's going to be this measure up to some constant, going to be this measure of the set where this little function is smaller than t, which is a different way of saying that the gaps distribution, I think I denote it by rho, the gap distribution rho is going to be the push forward of my measure by this function. Let me, right, so I have my sigma p and I have r, even r plus, and I have my function tau l. And here, whoop, sigma p is equipped with a measure. So tau l gives me a measure on r plus. Okay, that's what push forward means. If I want to measure a set in r plus, with this measure, I pull it back to sigma by tau L, I pull it back to sigma and then measure it with M. And this tells me what is my gap distribution, but not only that, the, the, the important thing is that it proves that there is a gap distribution. So this trick of going to the torus and calculate this thing, proves that these gaps actually have, are, are not just, uh, are not just an arbitrary set of 
uh, set of numbers, but they are actually coming with some kind of a structure at the background. And yeah, maybe this is already like beyond what I was talking about. So let me stop here for questions. Um, are there any questions? Uh, okay, so if not, let's all uh, thank you all. Uh, it was a very interesting talk. So thank you. Thanks. Um,